Now, if you would have just told me that WrestleMania was just night two, I would have said, wow, what a great WrestleMania. Unfortunately, you got to remember they had night one Saturday. Uh, you could just feel the difference. It was night and day between day one and day two. Day two felt like a WrestleMania. It had the big moments, the big stars, the surprises, the type of shit you would associate with a more traditional WrestleMania. And it made it so much better than night one. Well, the perfect no. Does it end in a way that I particularly care for? Fuck no. We all know that, right? It doesn't bother me. I'm not going to sit there and whine on the internet for months and months about it. You know, I'm not a Cody crybaby or some shit like that, pathetic shit like that. But, um, yeah, let's talk about night two of WrestleMania. And it starts off with Drew McIntyre challenging Seth Rollins for the World Heavyweight Championship. And I really thought that this needed to be a squash match. Because if it wasn't a squash match, then Drew looks kind of fucking stupid here. Seth Rollins just went almost 45 minutes last night. And you're going to have him come in and work a very competitive match with Drew McIntyre would be ridiculous, right? Well, they didn't quite go down that path of the truly competitive 50-50 match. But they had Rollins kicking out of way too many fucking Glasgow kisses. Like, no, just no, that's fucking dumb. Maybe let him kick out a one because he's a champion and he's got heart and all that bullshit. But get in, get in some shit, and get on with the fucking night. So Drew McIntyre wins. He gets his championship winning moment in front of an actual WrestleMania crowd. Cool for him. The little thing with Seth Rollins telling him you fucking deserve it. Like, that's cool too. But what was great about this match was all the shit that was afterwards. Drew McIntyre going too far and talking shit to CM Punk and then verbally getting into it at commentary and then eventually CM Punk goes after Drew McIntyre and out comes Damian Priest, bisexual taker. He's actually going to cash in. He's not a fucking moron. This was so well done. All the shit between, back and forth between Drew and CM Punk. Punk getting the one up on Drew, setting it up to fuck him to where Priest wins the title. Now you've got a new champion. You've really advanced the beef between Drew McIntyre and CM Punk. To me, the thing post-WrestleMania, as I look at the landscape and I wonder, in a lot of cases, what direction are you going? This is the one thing I could kind of sink my teeth into and say, you know, I give a shit about this thing. I actually believe in this shit. I actually want to see these two bitter, almost middle-aged guys you know, go back and forth. Like, this is fantastic. So the way this happened, Damian Priest cashing in, he got his big WrestleMania moment and the crowd certainly was hot for that. It was a great start to the night, even though, again, I don't think that Drew should have had to hit Seth Rollins with that many of his finishers. That was overdone, in my opinion. Uh, but the hits just kept on coming. That six-man tag Philadelphia street fight. B-Fab is just straight B-Fab. It's fantastic. Mwah. But she got involved, too. Her and Scarlett. Hey, they actually added something to the match. One thing I want to call out, though. I can't remember who it was. Was it Michael Cole? Or was it McAfee? Which one? I don't fucking remember. Or was it Grace? I don't know. But the whole thing of this is Paul Ellering's first time ever appearing at WrestleMania. Like, WrestleMania 8 didn't fucking happen in the interview with the freaking Legion of Doom. Where they introduced Paul Ellerling. What the fuck are you talking about? I wish he would have gotten at least a little involved in the match. But I'm happy to see WrestleMania 40 Paul Ellering still around. One of those really like un underrated and kind of forsaken great managers in wrestling history. But this match fucking kicked ass. And the primary reason it kicked ass. You could say having Bubba Ray come out and be the guest referee. Oh he was great. Like that was perfect. Philadelphia ECW tie in. But Snoop Dogg on fucking commentary. That shit slapped on so many different levels. It was so much damn fun. Just Snoop being Snoop. And you know, when you think about Snoop, let's think about this for a moment. Back in the mid-90s, he was beating a murder rap to now almost three decades later, he's on the Mount Rushmore of favorite black Americans for white people. 
And if you think I'm fucking with you, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Like, Snoop is on that level. White people just love fucking Snoop. And to go from that end of the spectrum to this end of the spectrum. Unbelievable. Only in America could that happen. But his energy on commentary. The you don't really know what he's going to say next. It actually makes the commentary interesting. Makes you enjoy and have fun while watching the fucking match. What a novel concept, I know. I wish he would have thrown in the how much does that guy weigh anyways comment. It would have been sent me over the fucking moon. R.I.P. R. Donovan. He was fantastic, though. Just freaking fantastic. And to me, when you think about celebrity involvement in professional wrestling, Snoop's on the Mount Rushmore. He has to be. He loves it too much. He has too much of a passion for it. He takes his shit seriously. He brings all of him to it whenever he's in an appearance. Like, always, whenever I see that Snoop's going to be there, I'm always like, okay, something good is likely to happen here. And this street fight was great. You know, the Pride got their win at WrestleMania. Bobby Lashley got some shine at WrestleMania. Fuck yes! I enjoyed it. Um, The next match, LA Knight taking on AJ Styles. The best part of this match, honestly, was the fact that it didn't start with a collar and elbow tie-up. Sure, you have LA Knight showing up in the Slim Jim car and pretending to give it away to somebody. And AJ Styles has his normal entrance with this crappy new music. But once AJ Styles comes down the ramp and they see each other, it's basically on fucking sight. And that's the way this had been built up for several weeks. Thank you. I appreciate this type of shit. Consistency to the story. Consistency to the level of it. Consistency to where you need to fucking be. This didn't need to be the type of match that had some big ass stare down, some technical wrestling bullshit to start you off. This needed to be, we're going at each other, it's on site. LA Knight gets his big WrestleMania win and was a solid match. Not spectacular, but solid. Uh, Wondering where they go with LA Knight from here. He was still pretty over with the Philly crowd, but I wonder, you know, how long that's going to last. We shall see. Uh, But it was good. The match wasn't great, but it was good. But so far, Knight 2 really delivering. And then you get to the triple threat match for the United States Championship. I giggled when Randy Orton got on top of the golf cart and he's riding down and he's telling KO to slow it the fuck down. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people thought this match was great. I thought it was cool. I thought it was solid for sure. Certainly wasn't the match of the night. That has to be the fucking main event. Um, but Logan Paul retains. Admittedly, I'm an old guy and I just don't watch that much streaming shit. I knew who KSI was last year. I had no fucking clue who I Show Speed was. Although I will say, like he had to be a soldier because Randy Orton kicked the shit out of him before he put him through the table with the RKO. And the table didn't break! Talk about consistency, damn it! But the whole time I'm watching this match, there's still something in the back of my mind. It's saying, I could have had John Cena versus Randy Orton at WrestleMania and I didn't fucking get it. That sucks. But oh well. Uh, Then you get the singles match for the WWE Women's Championship. And, you know, as I was watching this, there was something that really came to mind. All of these women's matches this weekend, all the women in action, and at no point in time do I have to be bothered by Charlotte Flair coming in and sucking the life force out of whatever she's involved in. Praise God, Ugga! And everything that is the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley. Or should I thank her ACL for fucking tearing? I don't know and I don't care, but thank God I didn't have to sit there and be bothered with her overforced, overpushed ass this weekend. Meanwhile, EO Sky defending against Bailey. Is that cultural appropriation? Like, I get where they were talking about the Egyptian park in California, whatever the fuck, but I said there, I'm kind of confused. I said, is, is, is she fucking Egyptian? <laughs> Am I missing something here? Is that appropriation? Does that really count for her? Like, what the fuck are we talking about here? Um, but Bailey gets her WrestleMania moment. She gets her championship match, her championship win. It was well-deserved. The match, again, was solid. I don't look at any of these matches on night two and feel that they were underwhelming or disappointed. I thought they all worked, right? I certainly thought they did. But again, even with all that being said, 
this was still going to come down to a one match show. It was. It was all about the main event, the Bloodline Rules match for the undisputed WWE Universal Heavyweight Championship of the World, Cody Rhodes, and Roman Reigns. And I was prepared for everything that happened here, for the most part, because you had to know that this was going to be chaos. Like, finish the story. This was going to be WrestleMania 39 was the Infinity whatever the fuck. Here's the end game, WrestleMania 40. So you knew this was going to be chaos. And once you saw a little Nate as the ref, you knew it was going to be fucking chaos. I was totally prepared for that. And it worked, right? Like you got plenty of standard match between Roman and Cody. Although I felt like with the stakes and what was on the line, I would have liked to have seen those guys be a little more extreme, a little more hardcore in the beginning part of the match but I get that you were saving it. But eventually you get Jimmy Uso comes out and then here comes Jey Uso and then here comes Solo Sokoa and then here comes fucking doo 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 the fruity pebble bitch himself, John fucking Cena. And you're like, holy shit. Like this is flowing exactly like it should. This is overbooked as fuck, but everything here fucking makes sense. And then of course you get the final boss, The Rock. And the stare down between him and John Cena was fucking big time deal shit. It was like a Hogan and Rock stare down. Sitting there looking at both ways at the crowd. And it was at this point I'm saying, okay, Philly's going to lose their shit when that glass shatters and out comes Austin. And it didn't happen. <laughs> you know, and, and quick side note here, quick side note. I'm sorry, but I got to point this out. <laughs> I think it's funny. All the things that Hulk Hogan did in the business, his legacy is going to be two things. One is racism. Well, three things. Lying, then racism, and then that doesn't work for me, brother. <laughs> for somehow, the Stone Cold didn't show up for whatever fucking reason. What? Oh, hell no. That doesn't work for me, brother. Give me a damn beer. That's not enough money. That's not enough spotlight for Stone Cold. I'm not taking a backseat to any other baby face. <laughs> so, you know, when The Undertaker's music hit, it was like, holy fucking shit, but it's not Austin. But I was actually surprised. I kind of appreciate it. And as much as Austin would have made sense in terms of the history with The Rock, in terms of the history with Roman Reigns and The Rock, the guy that made more logical sense as I kind of sit back a little bit now is Taker. Taker's last loss at Mania was to Roman Reigns. All the battles that Roman, or excuse me, Rock and Taker had throughout the years. Like it actually makes perfect sense, even though I understand why everybody would want to go and think Austin, like I did, frankly. Well, that shit worked. But the match really worked. And if you were going to go and do this, this is the way it needed to be done. Now, you could say you had to throw all types of shit at this to make it believable. You had to throw all types of shit at this to make sure it worked for Cody. But it is what it fucking is at this point. The, the story's fucking over. The crybabies can have their fucking moment. They've been waiting for this for quite a while. Let them bask in it. Let them enjoy it. I've been preparing for this for a year. It's whatever. Cody Rhodes is your new undisputed Universal Champion. And the 1,316 day reign of Roman Reigns has come to an end. You know, honestly, if I was going to complain about anything at this particular moment involving this match or having Roman lose or having Cody win, it wasn't anything but the match. Like, the match was fantastic. It was overbooked. Of course it was fucking overbooked. What the hell else did you think this was going to go? So many things involving the bloodline have been overbooked for three and a half fucking years. Why would you stop now? Especially at a moment in time and the way you were going, this shit made all types of sense. Like, even when you say Roman lost, likely because when Seth Rollins comes out and the shield music hits and he's in the shield vest, 
Roman just couldn't let the shit of the past be the past, and he just had to hit Seth Rollins like Seth did to him, Plan B, all those fucking years ago. And Seth sold it like Roman did all those years ago, and it was fantastic, right? Like, overbooked when it makes sense, overbooked when it's done right can really, really work. No, actually, the thing that annoyed me the most about it was just the lengths that they had to go to try and force this on everybody after the match is over. I don't even have the issue with the celebration thing, but it went on and on and on and fucking on. A uh, side note, props to the Breakfast Club. They showed up and did business this weekend. John Cena made sure he got himself a main event spot, damn it, for a couple of minutes work. Randy Orton said, I'm not doing the job for Logan Paul, brother, and he shows up in the ring to celebrate after the main event which is still the main event, damn it. And then after Cody's done all this celebrating and all this grab ass and fucking look at me and how happy I am in my moment and yay, it's like my daddy's dusty finishes back in the fucking day. He makes sure he calls Bruce Pritchard to the ring and Triple H, the man who started the show on Saturday, ends it on Sunday. Praise God, miracles can happen. The Breakfast Club, WrestleMania 40, Still doing big business. They even got Stephanie to start off the show, you know, like she's not part of a lawsuit or anything, or being made a lawsuit or anything, to try and advance the distancing from the father. They went out of the fucking way this weekend to say this is the Paul Levesque Triple H era of WWE. Cool, whatever. Yeah, the celebration was kind of, it's kind of like, yeah, I get it now. Get to the fucking point. This is great for you if you wanted this, blah, 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 but... You know, that's also the type of shit that eventually backfires because you force it too much. And you know, you got like Michael Cole crying. It's like, is it really that big of a deal? Like, I respect Cody for the fact that his first WWE run didn't end the way he wanted to. He went somewhere else. He kind of made himself. And then he comes back and he doesn't immediately get it handed to him. He gets a lot handed to him right away, right? But, you know... He managed to sustain a certain level of character. I don't have to like the son of a bitch, and I don't. And people saying, well, he's an incredibly likable guy, based off of your perspective, he's not a fucking likable guy, which is why him being a babyface is always kind of stupid. However, I respect his grind and his hustle. I don't know if it's worth crying about, though. That feels fucking weird. Um, it's kind of a surreal moment, too, right? Is they put all of this shine and attention on Cody... And basically completely swept away in an instant the 1,316-day champion. It was interesting, kind of weird, but whatever. You know, but like I said, the crybabies can have their moment. This is the moment they were pissing and moaning about a couple of months ago. This is why they went to their flaming keyboard fingers of fire and raged on the fucking internet because they just had to have this. You got it. The company pivoted. You should be happy. You shouldn't have shit to complain about right now. As far as for me, I don't know where this means for WWE going forward. You've got two world, new world champions. you got a new IC champion. you got a new women's champion. Feels like a lot of things have been kind of finished up. But, you know, like what type of involvement are you going to have from The Rock going forward? Does Roman just immediately go away and take time off? What do you do with Jim Uso, Solo to Sokoa? Jey Uso, right? Like, so many things have been tied up into the Bloodline story for so long. Where do you fucking go from there? That could be both exciting and concerning. And to me right now, it's a mix of both. Um, but like I said, Night 2 was so much better than Night 1. And for those that wanted Cody Rhodes to win, you got your goddamn story finished. Now let's see what type of story they can fucking tell from here.